Sí, sí, sí. Sí, sí. Yes, yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. I'm aging. This is called aging, having to change the office to do something. No, it's that I cannot have the bifocus because I have migraines. So, three more minutes. I'm trying to see which one is better. Yeah, 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 try with uh, my right. It should be okay, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. And apparently we've got no to minutes. stop him after 40 no minutes. minutes. See I mean, we've got to stop him after 40 minutes. If he goes on beyond 40 minutes. Uh, Ian, I ask him, uh, because that, I tend to talk too much. So if, uh, like 40 minutes, you will hear his voice it's simply to help me, because if not, I will carry on. So I'll end for 40, knowing I will do probably 50, but that's why I ask him interrupt me when I'm at 40, because if not, I will be here. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, yeah, we were before together. He was my unit leader. That's evil. <laughs> Running this year, so we Cecilia, that British people, be careful with British oh, yeah. people. Uh, I'm telling Cecilia, be careful with British people. With you, 10, 10, 10, 20, 2004. When we got the degree. Oh, no, you're right, 11. 11, 11 2003. My research. Yeah, yeah, yeah 2003. Yeah, like 2013. Yeah, 2013. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I tell you. 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 I it's more stressful than the public here. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> she won't drink. Uh, we have coffee tea uh, next door if you need anything and water. And then you have, you know, I think you're going to. Are we okay, Norman? Okay. 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 Who wants to go first after me? Ian or Cecilia? Do we the thing on top of the coin? Yeah, heads or tails. We are making the decision about the order. Heads. <laughs> Democratically. So heads, you go first. Tails, it's me. It's me first. Okay. Good. Right. 
You have the order now, Jorge, Ian, Cecilia. So a very warm welcome to Manchester Law School and uh, to the United Kingdom launch of Dr. Jorge Nunes' third title, uh, Cosmopolitanism, State Sovereignty and International and Politics, a Theory. So I got through the title. OK, it's published by Routledge as part of the Routledge Research in Legal Philosophy. Jorge started his academic career teaching the introduction to law in 1997 in his native Argentina. He then moved to the UK where he was awarded his PhD in law at Manchester University. After teaching jurisprudence in the School of Law at the University of Manchester, he joined us in Manchester Law School in 2013 and what an impact he's made. It's been fantastic. Uh, his research interests have varied, but he's an expert on issues pertaining to the crossover among legal and political theory and public international law and relations. He's been researching and publishing about territorial disputes for more than 20 years, which in itself is a massive thing, but my research says in English, Spanish and Russian. Yeah. Uh, leading the discussion today on Jorge's title are Dr. Cecilia Flores uh, Elizondo, Senior Lecturer in Law here at Manchester Law School, and Dr. Ian Brassington, Senior Lecturer in Law at the University of Manchester. And thank you so much for what you've done to kind of review the text and uh, being here leading the what will hopefully be a really fruitful discussion today. Uh, my name is Dr. Damien Mather, the international leader in Manchester Law School, and my co-chair is Dr. Hazrat uh, Chetinkaya. So over to you, Jorge. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you all for coming here. In particular, uh, I'm very proud because we have the deaf community uh, being represented. We have an interpreter here. We have Karen and maybe a few more people. Uh, second, my Latin American uh, friends and family. Uh, we have people today here face to face from uh, Peru, Colombia, uh, Mexico, and many other countries. And online, we have people from Argentina, Brazil, and the rest of Latin America. Because first of all, I'm Latin American, and second, I'm Argentinian, uh, very proudly. Um, Third, I want to say thanks to Ian. Uh, we used to teach together more than 10 years ago. Uh, so thank you very much. And Cecilia as well, um, because we share uh, quite a few things with Cecilia. As you may know, uh, this year marks a 200th anniversary for Manchester University um, and the Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, we started together with Cecilia many years ago, our PhD, and this year is our 10th anniversary together because we had a graduation together with Cecilia. Uh, so it, it's quite special to me. And this week in particular as well, uh, different celebrations. It's our ninth anniversary with Juris North. We right now have um, 11 institutions under the Juris North umbrella. It's my dad's birthday, so esta va para vos, papi, para mami. Y, and it's my birthday as well, so uh, Flor. <laughs> Uh, we will celebrate it by birthday with my friends in uh, Latin America on the 15th. So, uh, Cecilia, allow all the staff, you are going to be invited to a celebration on uh, the 15th of uh, March. Yeah. Uh, so, Flor, there you are. I told you this. Uh, well, welcome again. And now, my students, uh, because I do this uh, for my students, uh, I do believe in, we are here to make a change. Uh, and again, those who, who have been and are my students, uh, I've been teaching since 1997. I always uh, say the same, I look amazing, but I'm almost 50. I'm going to turn 48 uh, this uh, weekend. So I'm very proud. And I think that's why, you know, when colleagues ask me, you know, what's the connection? And I tend to have a laugh, it may be my accent. But it's because I believe in my students and my students believe in me. Uh, so thank you very much for your commitment, uh, because in many cases, my students come from working class uh, families and I am working class family. I came from working class family. So I know how much effort, you know, you put, uh, you know, to come to our classes. Uh, so thank you very much. Without anything else to say, in particular, thank you, Norman. He was my student. Now he's already uh, an LLM. Uh, a first, he got a first, so he will be helping me with the IT. Thank you very much, Norman. Uh, and let me see if it's working. Uh, yeah, perfect. And my contact details, uh, but again, you can ask me. The presentation, I'm aiming for 40 minutes, and the time starts now, Damien. So I'm aiming for 40 minutes. Uh, I will probably be talking for 50. I know myself. Um, that's why I asked Damien to interrupt me. You know, so at 40, he will say, Jorge, we are over. Uh, so then I will uh, give time uh, to Ian and then Cecilia. I think that was the order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, they will have comments, and then we'll open to questions and answers. My kind of presentation, again, my students know this, uh, I will not use technicalities for that, you can read the book. Uh, so I'm going to talk in plain language. 
because that's one of the issues we have when we discuss territorial disputes. Uh, we don't talk in plain language, and then people don't have a clue, and we have the atrocities going on in Israel, Palestine, Russia, Ukraine, and so on. People are ill-informed or misinformed about these disputes, and we have so many demonstrations with goodwill, good reason behind them, but ill-informed. Um, so my presentation today will have three parts. Why I'm discussing these two terms, cosmopolitanism and sovereignty, um, what is going on right now with uh, law and politics in particular, why we cannot seem to have a solution to these disputes. Uh, and then my take on how to better explore these uh, issues and uh, possibly solve them. Uh, by the way, I was having the discussion with Cecilia earlier. This is not the solution. This is not the methodology. This is just a view on how to have a different approach to this territorial dispute. By no way I'm claiming this is the solution or the methodology, because if not, I would be defeating the point. You know, I'm offering something else, but not the uh, something else. Um, why these two points? I think the, the, um, the, the, the better example or the best example was COVID, when we had a different state making different decisions uh, on how to address these issues. Uh, and then we have people subjected to whoever the government was. And I have um, just come from South America, and thanks, Damien, to, to be clear about it. This is not the, the global presentation because I'm doing presentations in different countries. Uh, I started first from home. I went to South America. I did Colombia, Peru, uh, Brazil, and Argentina first. And my global presentation was from Brazil because we tend to talk about the global south, but we don't really include the global south. So I decided intentionally to start from Brazil as my international presentation. Uh, so this is the British presentation for the British public, uh, because Britain is not the world. Britain is one of the many countries around the world. Um, so the point being, uh, we had governments such as AMLO in Mexico, the president at the time, telling people, and again, I'm not making a discussion, I'm not against AMLO or any other particular government. But that's a good example. AMLO was making a, a clear statement that people shouldn't have the vaccine. And then we had a particular and famous person in Latin America, Talia, a singer, a pop singer, asking people to have the vaccine. Uh, what I'm trying to say, in many countries we have this, in even Ecuador or countries in Africa, we didn't have access to vaccines, or when we had access, politicians didn't allow that access to happen. And that had to do with sovereignty. So the mixture, we have plural societies in every country. This is an example. We have people from all over the world right now in this room. Uh, however, we don't seem to have a coordinated answer when we have global crises, such as territorial disputes, such as the COVID uh, pandemic. So what I did, if you can, yeah, there we are. Um, what I found out, and that's my 2020 book, the one in the middle, because you make claim, well, you're talking about ideas, you're talking about theory. What I did in 2020, uh, I uh, did research on particular territorial disputes. So I divided the world into regions, uh, and I discovered, to my surprise, territorial disputes on the surface seem different, but they are very similar in many points. So in the Americas, I cover things like the Falklands or Malvinas Islands, the border, the resolved border between Mexico and the US, which in principle I say resolved because we know as Latin Americans, we still have an issue with the border. It's not the border between Mexico and, Brazil and the US, it's the border between Latin America and the US. Uh, Guantanamo Bay, of course, you know the Cuban example, and I, I could talk forever about this, and uh, natives, to put another example. We tend to be inclusive, but natives as lesser people in law. What do I mean by that? We are perpetuating what we learned from Spain, the UK, France, in the way we treat in law natives. One of the, we are the most evolved region in the world in terms of our national constitutions, all American states from Canada to Argentina, including Brazil. We all acknowledge uh, at the constitutional level natives, but we, the caveat, uh, we don't actually accept them to have right to self-determination on territorial issues. They cannot claim territory. We grant them human rights, but they cannot uh, claim territory. And that has been perpetuated since the time of the colony. Um, this um, is translated into, people ask about Falklands. Falklands are not that relevant for the British agenda. Falklands have to be with Antarctica. My research includes Antarctica as well. There is a reason for Falklands to happen in the British agenda. I know it's not the Falklands, it's Antarctica. And again, I can open up later when we have questions and answers. But the British are in the Falklands for one reason, which is the South. Um, well, 
Once again, uh, I move on to other areas in the world. Uh, you can see here Asia and Europe, even at home, we have uh, Crimea, we have here Northern Ireland, uh, or in Asia, as uh, you may know, Kashmir or the South China Sea. Hi, Phil, hi, Willow. Um, and again, moving on, we have in Africa and Middle East clear examples. I intentionally use maps as uh, just to make a point uh, and to be very brief. Um, we tend to talk about Palestine, we tend to talk about Israel, and people use maps, uh, ill informed, um, because these maps don't have really to do with Palestine itself, they have to do with a mandate, a British mandate. Uh, so when we see demonstrations, they are Again, based on ill information, malinformation, bias information. I'm not here for uh, Israeli government or for Hamas or for Palestine. I'm here for people uh, because I, I still see brothers and sisters fighting and killing each other simply because they have been ill informed about you know, what was really uh, going on. Um, so, the, the, one of the many partial conclusions from 2020, and again, uh, this is one of the many. Although we may see differences on the surface, there are many commonalities. One of the many commonalities, most of these disputes have the same historical root. They were created, they were designed uh, to happen. Kashmir was designed to happen. Uh, Nigeria, Biafra was designed to happen. Falklands was designed to happen. Israel was designed to happen. Gaza was designed to happen. Um, and nowadays, what I call, and this will be part of my next book, because I've already been commissioned to work on the next one, uh, Territorial Disputes in the Americas, the next one has to do with what I call colonial syndrome. Um, in uh, Specifically in Latin America, Asia, and Africa, we still think, even scholars think, that we must learn from Europe or the UK. Um, having said that, I'm against the colonial positions in the sense of reinventing the wheel. This is not to claim that the British are wrong or the Europeans are wrong. No, we have to learn from what was good about them, about their theories, and how can we embrace diversity through Latin American views, African views, Asian views, and so on. By no means I'm trying to, because I've seen many papers and we had, um, that's why my comment to Foluke, if you, uh, those who were- Paco, if you, ¿por qué no comes la tarta? Amy, por favor, cancela el volumen. ¿Eh? Eh, Este, te está escuchando. Bueno, ahora... Can you cancel the... Ahora te voy a comprar algo. Emi, por favor, se está escuchando todo. Sorry, in, in Spanish. Uh, so what I was saying, we had a presentation a few weeks ago from Foluque, an African colleague, and again, that's perpetuating uh, colonial syndrome. She was talking about natives, she was talking about uh, North America, and she was referring only to the US. Well, Mexico, I have a colleague from Mexico here, Mexico is part from uh, North America, and she was coming from Africa, and she had good intentions. However, uh, she was under you know, the pretense she was trying to provoke, which was uh, decolonialism. Um, so I, again, that's why uh, the colleagues who were online with me that time and, and my question and my comment, that's when, when uh, you know, uh, I was um, trying to refer to, you know, this, the colonial position when people still, without knowing, have that colonial syndrome within. Uh, and intentionally, I put two pictures here. Um, uh, France still feeding Africa, because my next presentation will be in Paris. Um, I think it's in May. Uh, because some countries in Africa are still paying taxes to uh, France. Surprisingly, 2024, France, a democratic country. Uh, and I put there Obama, the former President Obama, that had to do with uh, manipulation of the media. Uh, I still question why he was awarded the Nobel Prize when he was uh, the president with more uh, more present in territorial disputes all over the world, including if we compare to the Donald Trump administration. I'm not against Obama, I'm not against uh, Donald Trump, this is a fact. So again, study history because he had more present, his government, had more present in territorial disputes than any other president before. Uh, not including Biden, I'm not talking about Biden, I'm simply comparing with Donald Trump because he seems to be more on the news than Biden. Um, so, the, to sum up, um, again, another partial conclusion. When we talk about crisis, in particular territorial disputes, we may talk about Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, and so on. What I did, being a legal philosopher, as well as uh, my expertise in public international relations, 
I created my own fiction. Uh, so I created three parties, two sovereign states and one populated territory. So the first one could be Gaza or Crimea or the Falklands. And the two other columns could be Argentina, the UK, Spain, the UK, Israel and Palestine and so on. So I simply use elements from the most controversial territorial disputes around and I created a fiction. And normal, clever people with law degrees, political science degrees, and international relations degrees. I'm only talking about these three because I'm multilingual. I, I, my, all my books are for these specialisms in particular. But you can apply the same to history, sociology, and so on. Uh, clever people with many degrees, they tend to focus either or on territory, relation, territorial size, and so on, from a public law perspective, from a, a political science perspective, and so on. Um, so what we uh, have in law, political science and international relations, the current situation, key elements such as concepts, the concept of state, again, this is not a class about public international law, it's government, for those who are not doing law, government, people in a territory, that's a basic definition. In principle, we shouldn't have a problem between clever people. But then my research shows that if I'm a lawyer, I'm going to understand each of these elements within a state in a different way. So I'm going to apply different methodologies and different epistemological assumptions, such as if I'm a lawyer and I'm thinking about people, I'm going to think about whether these people have the same bloodline or whether they may have the same residence and so on. However, if I'm a political scientist, I'm going to still think about these people. However, in a different way, I may see whether they are part of a democratic regime or they are not, and so on. This will, and again, I can put the same example in terms of territory, in terms of government. That has to do with my 2020 research. Uh, so we seem to talk about the same concept when we, in reality, have different departures. Um, that has one consequence when we teach law, when we teach political science, when we teach international relations, and when we apply them to our articles and our books, we apply different conceptions of these concepts. Uh, so for, for lawyers, I see most uh, here are lawyers. Uh, for lawyers, we tend to talk about one element in particular when we talk about state. We tend to talk about territory. We talk about territorial sovereignty. Those who are experts on public international law, we define sovereignty through territory. We don't really care about people. Our definition don't care about people when we teach public international law. Uh, the, the most um, probably arguable example is Kelsen, the pure theory of law when we don't really talk about people or territory, we will talk about law as a norm, norm as a territory. Now, if I'm a political scientist, I really don't think too much about the territory. Of course, I will acknowledge there is a territory. But if I'm a political scientist, I'm going to talk about the dichotomy of the relationship between government and people. That's why when I teach political science, I'm going to refer to liberalism, Marxism, anarchism, and so on. Still, clever people with many degrees using the same vocabulary, departing from different assumptions. Um, the same with my mother concept, the, 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 the concept basic of my research, sovereignty. There are many definitions. In law, we have stipulated the definition, a Montevideo Convention. This concept, sovereignty, we don't have one definition. There are many definitions. Um, we tend to use this kind of notion, the highest, the absolute, the perpetual power. But again, I put one of uh, you know the, the main ones in English, the law dictionary from Oxford, as well to show an example. This very broad definition and any other definitions related to, they have many linguistic problems, such as the difference between, we still talk about absolute. This definition and this notion come from the notion of God. I mean, for those who study this concept, sovereignty, and I've been studying this concept for more than 20 years, it has to do with three normative systems. In particular, the uh, Abraham, the um, Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. And not even God, if you read your holy books, and they are part of my research, the holy books are part of my research, not even God is absolute, because even God himself committed to some agreement with human beings. One of the agreements being the rainbow. The rainbow is an agreement accepted by God himself to commit himself, to limit his sovereignty. 
So even if you use the holy books to tell me that I am a sovereign and I am absolute, you are lying to me. You are misinterpreting the holy books. Yeah? Why I'm saying this, I'm referring to the holy books, because the concept of sovereignty is based on uh, these conceptions. Uh, and that's the first distinction I make here between supreme and unlimited. When we talk about absolute, in reality, we talk about levels. That's why um, when Putin was on the news and he was talking about um, being a sovereign state, Russia being a sovereign state or in a colony, you have to understand Russian thinking, way of thinking. I'm not defending Putin, by the way. It's simply I happen to have a relationship with Russian colleagues for more than 10 years. I've been working in particular with St. Petersburg State University for more than 10 years. And Putin is a lawyer and he studied law at St. Petersburg um, State University. So I kind of know the background. And he's thinking in a vertical way, and I will explain later what I mean by vertical, in a vertical way. So if I'm the superior, I cannot have any normative authority over me. Why? Because if I do have a normative authority over me, I'm not sovereign anymore. That's his way of thinking. So when we see on the media his uh, statement being misinterpreted, it has to do with Again, not knowing the background. Again, I'm not trying to defend or go against. I'm simply trying to interpret how Russian thinks the law. Uh, and again, many others I could talk about, which I'm not going to uh, today because we don't really have the time. Um, one of the other examples, self-determination, was very close to me because I supported the referendum being from Argentina. I supported the referendum in 2013 on the Falklands, and I was in touch with Falkland Islanders, and they were sending me postcards from the Falklands. Um, because if you're a lawyer, you know people in the Falklands or people in San Andres between Colombia and Nicaragua or some of the people around the world, they don't have self-determination. As a lawyer, I'm talking. Why? Because they are not a permanent population, they are not from the territory, uh, and there are no real reason to think they may be subject to things like genocide. Yeah? Uh, Self-determination by means of independence has to do with an, a final remedy. Uh, so lawyers know in these cases we cannot apply self-determination. However, why did I um, support that referendum in 2013? Um, because the British were doing a political move, not a legal move. Because in political science, that referendum was having a way, was having a political effect on the globe. They were sending a statement to the world. So again, you have to discern when you see this kind of fact. The same with the Crimean referendum. They had two Crimean referendums. Uh, we may discuss whether they were legal or illegal, but that's not the point. The point they had a political reason behind them. Um, and again, that's usually the, the main terms state, sovereignty, self determination, and some others. Public international law. Do we have solutions? What do we do with these territorial disputes? Yeah, we do. We have solutions, we have institutions. Uh, however, we have Syria, we have Afghanistan, we have Iraq and Kuwait, we have Libya, and so many other examples. Um, the solution, we have the beautiful UN Charter. Uh, of course, I'm being condescending here. We have the many, many general uh, assembly resolutions, completely useless. And we have uh, the UN Charter. And as we know, for those who follow the news, if you are not lawyers, uh, we have exceptions to the use of force, a collective and self-defense. Yeah, tell me about it. Tell people in the Middle East people in some other regions of the world. So again, that has to do with the law and again, the politics, the political side of the law. Um, one thing I wanted to say, because I do have this discussion, we do public international law at this school uh, on the LLM in a very different uh, way. We do it critically. Uh, and we ask ourselves, and I ask my students, they are all professionals, whether the um, assembly is democratic. They know I don't think it's democratic, but I want their opinion and whether the whole UN, the Security Council, is democratic. And that has to do with lack of representation. Uh, so how can an entity that is not democratic tell us what to do with, in terms of territorial disputes? Um, and again, we have UN, different organs. We have a replica at regional level. Uh, we have in the Americas, we have in Asia, and so on. A menu of organizations and organs which are in charge of dealing with territorial disputes. 
All of them have to do with the same procedures. Uh, they tend to copy and paste the manual from the UN uh, Charter, mediation, negotiation, and so on. They are more particular. Suppose we have the law of the sea. They are more particular to the particular subject, of course. But in principle, the methods and the procedures remain the same. So we seem to have a menu, in principle, global UN, a menu, in principle, in terms of regions, how to put solutions. And then we have, I don't know why this, ah, there we are. Uh, this is my classification from 2017, uh, a list of remedies. I classify them in bilateral, unilateral, and multilateral remedies. So again, we have more menus here to put solutions. Again, I'm not going to discuss them. It's just simply to, put, to make a point. Uh, look how many. The Hong Kong formula, for those who have been to Hong Kong, uh, Shivon, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we have the sovereignty freeze, the Antarctica formula. Uh, we are not meant to discuss for 50 more years, you know, what's going on in Antarctica, apart from research, apart from climate change and so on. That will be a problem soon, same as Kashmir. I'm, I'm hoping to remember later, you know, that's one of my conclusions. But water will be the, the, the next thing in the future if we don't change mindset. Uh, and again, we have things like NATO, in the International Court of Justice and so on. International Court of Justice, very recently on the news with the cases of genocide, multiple cases of genocide, uh, countries like South Africa, Nicaragua, and so on, and I dare to say making a political move using people as a means to simply tell us that they are democratic regimes. Uh, so again, read a, a bit between the lines. I'm not against uh, using the International Court of Justice, I'm certainly against the why we are using the International Court of Justice. We are not thinking of Middle Eastern people, both Israelis and Palestine. We are thinking about our own regimes at home, because my research as well has shown that these territorial disputes are tightly linked to political prestige. They are self-produced in many cases, and they are perpetuated in many cases to keep some families, in particular in Africa, families, tribes, or some rulers in power. Um, Again, what I propose, I'm not complaining about the UN in particular, because I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. I'm not complaining about regionalism, because again, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. What I think is, it's high time to change paradigm, the way we think about them. Um, and this story comes from India, it's not mine. Uh, it has to do with six uh, blind men, and I highlight blind and men. They bump. Uh, for the first time into an elephant. And they try to, to explain each other what an elephant is. One of these blind uh, men tell the other, well, it seems to be very sturdy. It has to the shape of the column. He's touching a leg. So the elephant may be in the shape of a column. Another blind uh, guy says, yeah, completely wrong. This is bigger, this is larger. It feels like a wall. He was touching the skin of the elephant. Both of you are completely wrong. A third blind man says, it's wrinkly, it's very thin, this feels like a rope. He was touching the tail, and so on. So you can see what I'm trying to say. All of them were to a point right, correct, but all of them were completely wrong in describing the elephant. They were blind. Uh, that's why intentionally I use names here. We may have Boris Johnson, obviously, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, all men. Alberto Fernandez, former president in Argentina, in Brown, Khan, Pakistan, and Benjamin Netanyahu, Israel. And we may have a journalist, so clever people, a military man, a lawyer, and so on, with different visions about the same elephant. That's what I call unidimensionality. Yeah? What I propose, it's simply a shift, multidimensionality. We need to think about this in a more comprehensive way. What do I mean by that? Uh, and again, this has to do with my research. Um, I have several books. The main ones are three, but then I publish in Spanish as well, and as Damien said, in Russian. Uh, so um, th those are my main ones. The very first one here has to do with, I was asking myself how to put solution to territorial disputes. Uh, and Mark was here when I did a talk many, many years ago um, about my first one. It was not a presentation. Uh, I asked myself what, ideal people, not humans, because I departed from one assumption, humans are selfish. So I asked myself well, how ideal people would deal with Kashmir, Gibraltar, and the Falklands, and I came up with an ideal solution. Then the criticism, well, wait a second, this is a fairy tale, it sounds like Disney, so that's why my 2020 book, so I wanted to prove the concept, so I did research on particular territorial disputes. The latest, 2023, 
whatever we have is not working, I need to create my own theory to make it work, you know, to make it more understandable. So that has to do with what I call uh, pluralisms. Uh, this is the whole index. I'm not going to discuss the whole book, so I'm going to simply give the hallmark. So we know the why, we know what we have to fix the problem, why it's not working. And to me, because it's high time, and that's what we do at Public International Law here at MMU, we may talk about state, certainly, but we need to include individuals and we need to include communities uh, when we have this kind of discussions. Because sometimes communities do not follow what the government is telling them to follow. They may have different interests behind. Uh, individuals, I'm not only always thinking about the negative because we have individuals perpetuating conflict, some leaders perpetuate conflict, but we have some individuals who enable peaceful understanding. Uh, 1982, I was a child, uh, six years old, and uh, we had a conflict, a potential war between Chile and Argentina. The UK was in between, and thanks to the UK, we almost ended up in war. Uh, we, we are two Catholic countries, the Pope uh, John II had to intervene, and thanks to uh, John Paul II, we didn't have a war. We had an agreement and we settled the Beagle Channel issue, one of the main issues between Argentina and Brazil. We've been having peaceful understanding ever since. We had a small dispute in the 90s, but it was easily fixed. So again, individuals may enable conflict, but they may help cooperation. Communities, the example I tend to portray, uh, because I speak up, uh, speak up uh, on behalf of people who don't have a voice, especially internationally, natives, but we can talk about different kinds of communities or civil societies, LGBT community, uh, any kind of community defined. Yeah, I'm talking in particular as an example about the natives, um, because they don't seem to have a presence acknowledged in terms of their claim to territory. We have to be mindful, there are cases in Latin America, uh, and I've been putting the example um, between Argentina and Mexico, the Mapuche community, they define law, the natives define law in a different fashion, not the European fashion. The word Mapuche, and uh, you may uh, be familiar with Che Guevara or Che Guevara. Che Guevara was Argentinian. Che means people ontologically. That's why we call him Che, yeah? means people. Yeah? Mapu means territory. Mapuche, one of the, our natives in Latin, in Latin America, Argentina, and Chile, they define themselves as part of the territory. Yeah. So they will never understand our borders between Argentina and Chile as we understand them when we study law in places like Europe. Yeah. There is a caveat here as well. Uh, we used to have three communities claiming right, rights uh, in this border between Chile and Argentina. Right now we have 12 supported in some cases by British companies. So again, we have, I'm not asking to change by default the law, and that was my advice as well in Argentina, in Colombia. We need certainly to change the law, but lawyers know we have to be very particular about the vocabulary we use, because if not, we may open the floodgates. Uh, and again, it's been happening in South America, where we used to have very few actual native communities, and nowadays we seem to have multinationals behind these communities. By the way, the same is happening in Brazil. I discovered part of my research, and when I presented, the same is happening in Brazil in Amazonia. Some multinationals are using natives uh, as a means to obtain a claim to the territory. So we have to be mindful when we change the law. Um, another pluralism here, for those who are into game theory, I use game theory, I borrow from game theory. Uh, so I, I talk about uh, this Asian, States, communities, and individuals being able to play different roles. If I'm a host, if I'm the UK or Argentina, I can decide in terms of law and politics about Falklands. However, if I'm a Falkland Islander, I'm subject to Argentina and I'm subject to the UK. So for the UK, I will be a participant if we have negotiations. But for Argentina, Argentina's position has been very clear. I will be always an attendee. I don't have any voice, let alone a vote to a negotiation. The same can be said that Israel, Palestine Roundtable, in terms of diaspora, for example. The same can be said in terms of Crimea and Russia with Ukraine and so on. So again, this can, and that has to do with, again, game theory. So when you know game theory, you, you see what I'm talking about. There are different roles, and usually they are set up by the main host. The rest will have to participate or attend to, depending on whatever the host decides. Exactly what we see at the international level. Uh, another pluralism, 
uh, we tend to talk in terms of territorial disputes about the global, the international. We fail to see there is a domestic component and there is a regional component. Uh, I'm going to be positive here because I am an optimistic. There is a, a positive view in terms of regionalism. Uh, Latin America is the best example. We are the most peaceful region in the world in terms of territorial disputes. We have narcos, we have guerrilla, we have any other issues, social issues, financial issues, corruption, but we don't have territorial disputes to, that escalate as we see in some other. There is a reason. The reason is we have local, regional guarantors. Yeah? That's a lesson we should learn around the world as well. Why? Because in the region, in the Middle East, we should have Iran or places like Saudi Arabia backing up any peaceful agreement. If we don't have Iran or Saudi Arabia behind any peaceful agreement, unfortunately, that peaceful agreement won't work. I'm talking Israel-Palestine here. And again, I can go. Uh, why I'm talking regionalism? Because we shouldn't let UN or countries like the UK or the US be involved in the solution of these territorial disputes unless they are welcomed by both or the three parties involved. Uh, it should be a local slash regional solution supported by the global community. Yeah? Uh, and again, that's my take at least on how to solve them. Realms, um, we may talk about uh, factual issues, whether there is a river, whether it's a mountain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to me, I'm going to simply stop and at one a level here, the normative level. Intentionally, I didn't use the expression legal. I use the expression normative because it is high time and I'm using this platform and I, I always try to be very mindful because we have, in particular in this country, people from different faiths and religions. But we need to discuss, include these discussions, uh, other normative systems different from law. So in addition to law, we need to include religion and we need to include morality. That's why part of my research, I've already done the Torah, I'm, I've already done the Bible. I'm now, thanks to Noman, my first copy from the Quran is from Noman. I'm right now studying the Quran. Uh, and I dare to argue uh, against people in Palestine. When I mean people, leaders in Palestine and leaders in Israel, uh, that nor Allah or God can support what's going on behind the atrocities, uh, let alone killing children. To use children, and I'm going to be very clear about this, to use children as human shields or to kill them goes directly against the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran. That's not supported by Allah or God. So whatever other interpretation is ill interpretation. These people are not orthodox. It's ill interpretation of holy book because the holy book certainly are against sacrificing children. Uh, I wanted to make this point clear because for whatever reason, um, and I'm going to talk from personal experience here. I used to think the UK was an inclusive country when I used to live in Argentina. And I love the UK. It's my favorite country in the world. It's in my heart. That's why I'm in the UK. But in Argentina, most of my mates were Jewish because we have one of the largest Jewish communities around the world. Um, I guess you know history behind the reason. We have as well the Nazis as well in Argentina. But well, I'm talking about the Jewish. Um, so cutting the story short, I remember my childhood, we celebrated Hanukkah and Christmas equally because we didn't class ourselves as Jewish, Catholic, Anglicans, or whatever else. We were families, the Nunez, the Flores, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the Brassingtons. I come to the UK, and again, I'm in love with the country, uh, and it's growing, but I come here and we class people as Muslim or Jewish or Catholics. I've never seen that. I used to think, you know, this was an inclusive. Um, and why I'm saying this in particular in the UK? Because I think the key is in the UK. The key to solve this issue should start from the UK because we have a, pl a global platform. I don't know if British people, I keep on telling my British students, you have a global platform only this country offers to have an impact around the world, which could be a positive or a negative impact. Uh, and we have a mission and we have to fulfill that mission, which is if we want to bring peace to use that platform we have in the UK, to create a room for a fair discussion, which should include all normative systems. We need to discuss. Uh, I'm not going to extend because I could apply the same to LGBTQ issues. Whoever says that the Quran is allowing to, for people to be beheaded has a, has a very little understanding of the Quran. Yeah, that can, and we will have 
very soon roundtable some Q, uh, queer theory, uh, uh, queer theory, sorry, and we will talk about the Quran, the Bible, and the Torah. Uh, that wrong interpretation of the holy books once again. Um, well, I could go forever about the pluralism, but I'm go not going to do that. I'm going to simply, uh, and there, are, there is more, the, the, I, I classify as well in objects, uh, which I'm not going to explain as well. So we may talk about cultural objects, ideal objects, such as definitions, or a river, a natural object, or metaphysical objects such as God. Uh, I don't have the time, I, and this is too much uh, detail. So what I'm going to do with this, um, one of the final conclusions, I'll probably take five to seven minutes to, are we okay with time? Perfect, good, thank you very much. Well, I'll take 10 then. Um, a single approach, and I'm not talking about um, interdisciplinary because that's not enough. We may include rational elements, any discipline, law, political science, and international relations, sociology, history, and so on. But we need to include as well non-rational elements such as nationalisms and passions. Why? Part of a, a book, I, it's one of my favorite I've been using in 2017, 2020, 2023, victory, how we define victory, human. Victory doesn't mean to win. Victory is to see you suffer. And that's how many conflict have been defined by leaders around the world. I need to see the opponent suffer because I need to show my people that they are suffering. Uh, I need to have the support from my people. Uh, so again, don't think victory means the same to all people because in many cases, victory does not mean peaceful understanding, it means simply to see the opponent suffer. Um, so that's why to me it's very important not only to talk about interdisciplinary studies, but to go beyond discipline and to incorporate, and there are very new congresses, and Chris is very familiar with this, law and emotion, we tend to see them, law, IT, law and emotion, but emotion has been recently incorporated, as if now human discover we have emotions. What we do, and leaders are manipulating those emotions. That's why it's important we explore them when we intend to understand these conflicts better, if the aim is to resolve them. Um, now, I'm going back, let me see. So, a regular human being would see this, a regular lawyer, a political scientist would see this in Crimea, Russia, Israel, and Palestine, Falklands, Mal Argentina, and the UK. But if you study further, you should see this when you explore any of these conflicts. They are much more complex than that. Um, so again, if we want to comprehend them, we need to explore them in a different way, in a different fashion. Um, this is probably the methodology Cecilia was talking about earlier. I'm not going to go into detail because it's quite complex, but um, I'm talking about how we explore the elephant. Well, regularly, we tend to use what I call linear dimensional understanding. Uh, so I classify this kind of understanding with using law, politics, and uh, international relations, and I include as well nonlinear. Uh, I refer as well to two variables that we tend to accept by default, but we don't really conceptualize time and space. Because you may conceptualize time as something being eternal or time as something being time, momentums. Yeah? And that will have to do with your understanding of concepts such as sovereignty or concepts such as state. It's an eternal versus a time limited concept. A space, um, for that I'm using Buddhism, by the way, a time and space, you know, to in order to maximize, you know, the interpretation. Uh, I'm using Buddha from Buddha himself uh, by his disciples when I'm doing the classification. Um, and again, space may be defined in different ways. We've had as well congresses recently on how to define or how to conceptualize space. Because space may be legally defined in a very narrow or in a very broad sense. But we don't tend to discuss this. How do we define space? Is it a social space? Is it a, an artificial or fictional space? Or is it a real physical space? And so on. Again, I'm not going to discuss. Uh, it's simply to show you what I mean. If I'm Putin, I'm going to understand the concepts in a vertical way when I'm talking about a territorial dispute. If I'm the UN Charter, I'm going to understand them in a horizontal way because, again, those who do public international law, we have the core principle, sovereign equality. Yeah, so we are, in principle, equal. Yeah. Now, if I'm British, depending on my policy, and if I'm the prime minister, I may apply what I call a diagonal or transversal. So whenever it's convenient to me, I may apply equality, so I'm horizontal. Whenever 
I see something else that may apply a vertical understanding and the Crimean referendum was illegal. Yeah, am I clear? That's more clear for those who are Latin American at the time of the colonies. Um, when Spain came, they discover uh, Latin America um, or when the UK or when uh, any other country, the same can be said in Africa or in Asia, when they discover us, um, they apply vertical versus horizontal. So UK was accepting, was acknowledging countries such as Spain and Portugal as equals. Yeah, that's law. In law, I'm talking equals. There are many treaties back in history. Uh, so in principle, they use horizontal understanding between each other. But then the natives were not people legally talking. They were not. That's why they didn't. And we are still perpetuating that idea. And we are being the colonial, but we are still perpetuating the idea. The natives, they were applying a vertical understanding of the same concepts. Yeah? That has to do with again, the diagonal. So when it's convenient, I will apply vertical. When it's convenient, I will apply horizontal understanding. But I mean, I leaders uh, I'm talking about. And now the nonlinear, uh, there are different ways as well. You may explore the same elephant or the same territorial dispute in a different way. Again, just to put an example, self-refer. Again, I could talk about all, but I, I, I don't want to, you know, to, this to, to change into a class or, you know, a, a long speech. Self-refer. There are leaders of families, this is particularly of Africa, families are tribes, they're perpetuated, they are power by creating themselves the conflict. This is a self-referred conflict. Um, there is a very good documentary uh, from the BBC, surprisingly from the BBC, because they are very autocritical about the British slash American uh, regime at the time of the Iraq Kuwait uh, uh, issue. Uh, it's called the power of nightmares. You have two ways to convince people, through cooperation or through fear. Yeah? Usually self refers leaders use fear in order to feed an enemy outside and to perpetuate conflict. The conflict is convenient to them, or in cases in Africa, to their families, to keep their families lineage. Again, I could put other examples. It's just, again, the same territorial dispute could be explored in linear or non-linear ways and in different sub ways, depending on which one. Um, I'm not going to talk about this because it's going to take too long. Um, so the final conclusion, and this is ongoing, the final, and it was your question on Monday, um, I propose what I call, um, I discern different ways you know, to, to, to define this, uh, to, to technical as well, but I propose a set of soft principles, uh, what I call universal law. Because when we teach public international law, we teach it wrongly, and for that, that's why legal philosophy had to do with this book in particular, because legal philosophy are better suited to, to deal with this, uh, because they are more peculiar about the vocabulary. It's not that they know more, it's they are more peculiar, and we have a philosopher here, so philosophers are more peculiar about vocabulary. Um, why? And that's Kelsen, that's when I use Kelsen, only for this one in particular. Um, because we may talk about domestic versus international. We know that when we teach law. Yeah? International, we tend to talk about regional international law or global. Global, regional being the EU, the European Union law, the Americas and so on. Global, we are talking about United Nations, most of the countries around the world. What I'm talking about when we see the literally universal has to do with all of them, a combination of the domestic plus the regional, plus um, the global international law, because we need to coordinate COVID being the best example. We didn't have any coordinated response globally. And people were dying in Africa, people were dying in the UK, people were dying in Italy, yeah? Because we lack universal law, a coordination. Exactly our chat before we came here, because uh, one of my students now, he was asking me, you know, we need to, no, it was his idea actually. And I said to him, well, your idea is actually published already. Uh, because that's what I'm trying to say. We need to coordinate. Why I'm, again, being particular about the expression? Because I don't want to have a vertical understanding. That Kelsen as well, superior versus inferior. In that way, I, I, I um, distinguish myself from classic jurisprudential thinking. I think we need to find a way, and this way I propose a set of principles, and we can have a discussion about which one should be the principles. I'm simply offer a few examples of a, such as humanity. Um, Again, in order to coordinate different domestic, democratic or no democratic regimes, because we have to accept the fact there are some places that are not democratic. We need to accept that fact. And, we need, and that's why, again, that's have to do with 
superior to inferior because my intention is not to impose democracy around the world. If not, it will defeat the point. Most, some of the country will not accept ever the project. Yeah? So we need to go for soft principles in law in order to be able to coordinate these different regimes, legal and political. Uh, and to wrap it up, an invitation, two minutes, an invitation. This is in particular for people from the Americas, from Canada to um, Argentina, inclu including Brazil. I have already been commissioned uh, to write the next book, which will be based on territorial disputes in the Americas. Um, so I'm already working on that to apply, and that was our chat earlier with you, to apply the theory, because this is a theory slash a methodology to dispute. The first one will be um, my African students on DLM want to do Africa. Well, that may be the next one. But the first one will be America. Um, and I'm inviting all uh, colleagues and students as well uh, from all the Americas to participate. There are a few conditions. First one, they have to be bilingual because I want people to be able to read in Portuguese or Spanish and English because we need as well to include other sources in addition to English sources. Um, and then uh, all royalties, as you know, all my royalties go to Brazil, to a charity I've been representing for a few years, and I'll refer to the charity later, uh, but that's a condition. So I will acknowledge every support, every help, um, but that's a condition. And I don't know if I have people, uh, Juan Pablo, estás ahí? Because I have people from Colombia, from Peru, and uh, from Brazil and Argentina right now working, and I had a meeting with Andrew as well, telling him that I already have research groups uh, and these people offer their time, and we have meetings regularly every week, and we work on our chapters. Uh, we are going to have 10 chapters. We have already written six of these 10 chapters, and this is the collaboration, and these people are willing to uh, put their time. Uh, I don't know if Fabio is there, Tatiana, Valeria, I, I saw them uh, online earlier. Um, hola? Yes, uh, hola, Jorge. Hello, everyone. Hello, Jorge. Uh, that is my camera on? Uh, no. no. Oh, ah, yeah, I, I can see you, Fabio. Well, uh, I'll present myself. Uh, I'm Fabio Fernandez. Uh, I'm from Peru, a uh, law student from Peru, from Universidad San Ignacio Loyola. I met Jorge when he presented his book, uh, as he is doing now, but in my university. And I was really interested in what he was proposing. Uh, and we, and well, I ultimately started researching on the part of. Uh, the conflicts in the Americas, Americans versus Americans, uh, and currently um, focusing on a part between Peru and Ecuador, and also on the multiple legal uh, principles that are involved in these conflicts and the resolution of them. Thank you very much. Do you want to share your story about your father? Oh, yes. Uh, for example, uh, something that also got me very interested in this is that my father, uh, was in the Senepa War. Senepa War was uh, the last war between Peru and Ecuador in 1995, uh, where he was a war reporter. He has a lot of things from that war, from bullets to uh, <laughs> to other souvenirs, to even uh, reports that he has made that I'm currently using into my research. And, well, obviously, as I want to keep the Hey, that's from my father alive. I, I, that also got me very, very excited to participate into this, into the development of this theory. Gracias, Fabio. Uh, no problem, Jorge. Well, and um, so to finish off, 30 seconds now. Um, what I've been trying to do around the world, and the next step will be continental Europe and then Asia. Uh, this is coming from Argentina. I'm trying to bring a message of reconciliation because I fail to see people talking about bringing peace. Uh, this is not mine, this is from one of our Argentinian authors, Jorge Luis Borges, it's my own translation. People took a funny decision here. People from different tribes, different religions, decided to think of their affinities rather than their differences. And that's what I'm trying to bring with my methodology as well. And I don't think it's ideal, I, I think it can happen, because I, I have people like uh, Fabio, a LLB student, and I have people, ex-judges and uh, meritus professor working with me right now, believing in this vision. Um, so again, the invitation is open. My final one, um, that's why the deaf community, and thank you, Karen, and our interpreter, because they are representing the deaf community. I'm very proud uh, to say I've been included and I've been working with the deaf community in Manchester for more than 15 years. 
And the first sign is this one I learned many, many years ago back in Argentina, more than 30 years ago from that lady, Shusha Menegel from Brazil. She came to Argentina and told us that we should accept everyone regardless of our differences. Uh, people tend to assume this means I love you. It means something deeper than I love you. It means I accept you the way you are. That is why I love you. That is inclusion to me. Not simply talking about skin color, not simply talking about gender issues, because there are white people that are deaf as well, or blind. There are LGBTQ people that may have any other issues as well that not, may not be visible. Even myself, I've been having medication since I was four. Um, so what I'm trying to say here, we are all different, and that has to do with inclusion, accepting our differences. And why the Pope? Because the story says that the Pope learned that sign in the Philippines. That's wrong. As you may know, the Pope is from Argentina. That Pope learned that sign from Shusha Menegel, a Brazilian artist working for children for more than 40 years now. And I'm very proud to say, uh, and I'll finish with this one, Damian, uh, that I right now represent her foundation it's been more than five years, uh, and that's my team in Brazil. Uh, I have a team in Brazil as well. That's my team in Brazil. We work with children and teenagers uh, in one of the most deprived areas in the whole of Brazil. It's Rio de Janeiro, 60 kilometers from Rio de Janeiro city center. And Phil sees me, Phil and Willow are my neighbors. They see me training when I do marathons um, because my royalties go to them. Uh, one of the reasons, because Shusha is behind that uh, charity, and I know there is no corruption, because that's one of our problems in Latin America. Secondly, I'm very proud to say the guy next to me, Vinicius, he was part of a project. Uh, he's uh, slightly younger than me. He was part of the project since he was six years old. And in that charity, he met his actual wife, his current wife. He could have been dead, a prostitute or selling drugs. We know what Latin America may, you know, what may happen. And I'm very proud to say, uh, thanks to this uh, charity, he is now the president of Fundação Angelica Goulart. Without anything else, simply uh, thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here. And thank you very much uh, to all. So we know I have a couple. I know that. <laughs> but you didn't shout. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. It was very, very, very strong. Thank you. Ah, well, I said 50. Yeah. And I need, I know you. Uh, <laughs> so, which one? <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, my preface to this is that I'm not. Um, an international lawyer. I'm not a public lawyer. I'm not a lawyer at all. I'm not a historian. I'm not a political economist. This is going to be very much. I'm basically picked up a couple of riffs, or a couple of motifs from the book that I'm going to riff on. So it's basically jazz, but um, jazz musicians apparently know what they're doing. Um, I've also, I mean, I've, I've got pages of pages of stuff that I've written before, but I've also been making notes, which I very, very quickly want to go through some of the notes based on what you just said. So just a few things that occurred to me as, as, as you were going through. So you made a claim early on about a year or two ago um, that we don't have coordinated responses to things like COVID. I'm actually kind of open up. Okay, well, OK, but so I'm not sure what that tells us about, about law or territoriality or cosmopolitan sovereignty, that kind of stuff. Uh, you talked about rights to self-determination in the Americas again. Well, you know, states form. You could be kind of historical about it and say, you know, in the same sort of way that the people of Wessex didn't have self-determination when they were annexed by Mercia. So it goes. Uh, so it's not obvious why we should be all that bothered about that. You claim that territorial disputes, you said that they were designed to happen. So you mentioned Kashmir, the Falklands, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure I quite follow that. It's, it seems to me that we could say that it's obviously true that they wouldn't have happened but for deliberate choices made by Smith or Jones. It doesn't follow from that that the consequences of those deliberate choices were deliberate. And that seems to me to matter when we're evaluating what's going on. Um, blah, 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 blah. Let's have a look. You talked about the concept of sovereignty. Uh, the religious bit kind of was interesting. You talked about the com concept of sovereignty in the Western tradition being derived from religion. And again, I, I guess, well, you might want to say, sure, it's the, the way that we think about sovereignty as coeval with a particular religious religious outlook, but it doesn't follow from that that it is a product of religion. 
and you could kind of argue against your position that something like the Treaty of Westphalia, um, which is where the modern concept of sovereignty sort of really takes 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 root, is a repudiation of the religious in, you know, institution because um, it's essentially telling right no longer can you invade another country because they're the wrong sort of Christian. <laughs> Um, so yeah, and, and when you, you you talk about what what, what you know, religious inclusivity and what holy books say, and again, I'm slightly worried that there's a sort of no true Scotsman aspect to that because essentially you're saying that whatever I approve of is what God approves of, and if you disagree, then that's because you've misinterpreted what's going on. But of course, everyone can say that. So again, I'm not sure that gets us very far. Well. Anyway, so that was just a few intuitive bits based on what you've just said. More generally, um, as I said, the the book has got a lot going on in it. It's a very, very rich book. It bears re repeated reading. So I'm just going to pick up on a couple of themes that I noticed. Um, and the core problem that it seeks to address is one of how we should think about sovereignty and about cosmopolitanism, which on the face of it do seem to be you know, antagonistic in a sort of everyday common or garden sense. Um, I want to suggest that maybe that that's not the case, but not necessarily for the same reasons that Jorge does. Um, so he gives to me what looks to me, well, he gives what looks to me like an important articulation of the position on page 58, claiming that the observable difference between cultures and communities can only be accommodated in the system of positivist or what he calls positivist cosmopolitanism. So in this view, legal systems may recognize extra, extra territorial interests that they have in another state based on, for example, diaspora communities existence, whatever. And this is enough to make the world a cosmopolitan source of place. The system itself is not only agnostic about moral claims that one legal system may make or initiate this. Again, this is the position I imputing to you. In fact, it's, it's avowedly secular or in, or in Jorge's own language, exclusive positivist about value claims. Mm. Again, as we'll see, I'm not sure how far we can or would want to push that, 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 that claim about positivism, but we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. The thing that I was, that, kind of just kept nagging away at me is that much is going to depend in all of this about what we think that sovereignty is to begin with. So if we define it as being opposite to cosmopolitanism or universalism or something like that, then of course we're going to find that there are difficulties reconciling the two, because you know, that's just how we've set up the, the debate. Even if we think that those difficulties can be overcome in the end, then we've kind of de defined them into existence. Now, I confess that I can't find a, a, a nice sort of capsule definition of sovereignty in the book, though there's a couple of pointers. So on page 42, we've got a claim that a sovereign state is one that conventionally understood has, quote, exclusive prerogatives over their territory and population. And the, the same passage continues to say correctly, I think that sovereignty, that sovereign states can be limited by outside agents. The quote, the crucial element, the crucial element seems to be that one state implicitly or explicitly gives another permission to impose limitations or simply accepts them, analogous in some ways to slavery, as opposed to agreeing to serve another individual in specific ways. Now, there are questions that we can ask here. For one thing, I'm not sure about the slave the slavery analogy, um, because I don't think slaves have in any meaningful sense given permission to the person who is controlling their lives from outside. So it seems like a very strange analogy to draw. Um, equally, the slave cannot withdraw from the agreement in a way that sovereign states um, presumably can. But park that for a moment. There still seems to be some begging of the question in as much as that being able to say much about territory and populations belonging to a state presupposes its sovereignty. So we're not going to get an understanding of what sovereignty is by saying it's, you know, by, by, by talking about what states can do to a population, because we're only talking about its being its population if we've got a concept of sovereignty to begin with. Else, else, so that, that's, that's a little difficulty. Elsewhere, Jorge re rehearses the quotation from Martin and Law, according to which sovereignty is the supreme authority within a state. Now, again, that's not quite a definition so much as a characterization, but it's a useful pointer. Um, and we get in the pages that follow in the book, as a general sense of sovereignty being something that states have to a greater or lesser extent that we would probably think other, st other states ought to recognize. So we've got sovereignty as a kind of starting point, and then the question would be to what extent other states recognize it. 
A slightly more sophisticated account would have it that a state is sovereign to the extent that it is capable of entering into agreements with other states or to fall out of them under its own auspices. So, for example, Staffordshire is not sovereign because it can't enter into treaty agreements with France. Um, neither could Staffordshire declare war on France. Um, but the quid pro quo is this also has the protection that the French cannot declare war on it. Um, of course, Staffordshire is not a state, but the same is going to apply to entities that are at least more state-like. Bermuda and the Falkland Islands have at best a very limited ability to interact with other states, to enter into, into treaties with them or to fall out with them. And any autonomy that they do have is kind of on sufferance. On sufferance. Uh, and that could be withdrawn. By contrast, a country like Jamaica, equally at one point, could not enter into agreements with other states. But now it can. So again, this is for a fairly standard account of what sovereignty looks like. Working out the contours of so-called on international law on this account helps us see why there might be a problem reconciling cosmopolitanism, uh, cosmopolitanism with sovereignty. We might think there's a problem here in as much as the states rely on other states being bound to agreements entered into or by conventions about re respecting each other's sovereignty. But that seems to imply a need for some kind of supranational body that can in principle tell states what to do and what not to do. Uh, and then that seems to undermine the sovereignty that it's supposed to protect, because they're all relying on some kind of leviathan, if you like. But what if nobody recognizes a putative state sovereignty? On the common or garden approach, it would still be there. It's just that no you know, people are ignoring it, but we would still want to say, you know, either France is or is not sovereign, irrespective of who's trying to, to, to invade it. Or visions of the people of Staffordshire invading France now. Uh, but it would plainly not have any normative force. and It would not be clear what the difference is between a state that has sovereignty that nobody recognises and a non-state that has none to recognise in the first place. So if everyone agrees, uh, agrees sort of like a Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, great, we're going to invade Poland. What's the difference between ignoring Poland's sovereignty and Poland not having had it in the first place. And yet they do, there does seem to be a difference there, which we need to account for. Now, it seems to me, coming to this as a naive, that recognition is, is key. And this speaks directly to claims about cosmopolitanism, but we're not there yet. To say that recognition is key to sovereignty uh, does, does make progress. Um, right. First point. Let's look at things from the from the wrong end of the telescope. Imagine a world in which there is only one state. So we might be looking to the future where the European Union has become a state and the African Union has become a state and the, of some future Levantine Union that, of, of what was Israel and Syria and Iraq have become a state. So they've kind of agglomerated into large states and then even further down the, the line, they've unified into a world state, sort of Star Trek world, right? And they've unified into a world state. Or imagine that we're living on a, on a, on a large island that has a tolerably, sophist tolerably sophisticated polity, but whose inhabitants are simply unaware that there is other land elsewhere on Earth. It, it, it amounts to the same. What would it mean to say that this state is sovereign? Or that it would assert its sovereignty somehow? And the answer to that, it seems to me, is not a great deal. It doesn't seem to make a great deal of sense to talk about sovereignty when you've only got one player in the game. So in this sense, sovereignty seems to presuppose some kind of relationship with another state. So it presupposes something like a cosmo some, some kind of cosmopolis, because if you don't have that, it had never occurred to you to talk about sovereignty to begin with. OK, so let's complicate things. Now we've got a world with two states, but one refuses to recognize the sovereignty of it. It makes a territorial claim over the other. But again, what would this mean? On the face of it, we've reached an impasse. Alpha claims to be sovereign, Beta denies Alpha's claim. Beta claims that Alpha is not sovereign, A, Alpha denies Beta's claim. OK, so where do we go from there? It's not easy to tell. Indeed, suppose that an angel with an interest in geopolitics just happens to appear, because this sort of thing happens in my world, and sets about the task of untangling this dispute between Alpha and Beta. Um, well, he's going to need some kind of standpoint on which to decide whether Alpha really was sovereign. 
and this speaks to something that puzzles me about Jorge's explanation of territorial disputes and how they could be settled in the closing chapters of his book. He seems to me to, to suppose that all claims to territory and to sovereignty over territory are in their own terms equally meritorious, and I'm not sure that that's the case. They may sometimes be. So, for example, if Alpha controls the headwaters of a river upon which, uh, upon access to which uh, the, the, the welfare of a large portion of Beta's population depends, then Beta's denial of, of Alpha's sovereignty may be wholly in good faith. So it's, this is an echo of the sort of familiar Lockean bit about your neighbour has a, has a well on his land, and can you use that well? So we could imagine a conflict, an imaginary conflict between Egypt and other nations further up the Nile. If, 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 if let's say Uganda decides it's going to build a massive hydroelectric electric project, the Egyptians might say, hang on a sec, we've got skin in the game here. Um, and some of these dispute, disputes in good faith are just the, the long tail of history. So the Kashmir example might, might be a good one or Gibraltar um, or your friend mentions the Peru, Ecuador. I happened to be in Ecuador in 95 in the jungle when that war sort of burst into play and we were sort of, I, I, we, were sort of we have to leave this part of Ecuador. It's now technically a war zone. It was like, OK, I didn't expect this in my sixth form. Um, other disputes, though, will not be in good faith. I dare to suggest, notwithstanding the company here, that the Falklands dispute is in some sense a concocted one. Again, there is an element where we've got the long tail of history playing, but I don't think Galtieri in 82 was really acting in good faith. I think he just was opportunistic. Crimea also strikes me as, as not being a good faith argument. And even those that are in good faith don't always have much merit. So the, the question is going to be between Alpha and Beta, what's the criterion by which Gabriel is going to untangle our mess? How do we assess good faith? Sovereignty is implying multiple actors suggests an answer. So the model I have in mind here, and again, this may be horribly naive, would be something like this, that Alpha has sovereignty over some territory T, if and if the scope of Beta's behaviour in respect of T is constrained by the expectations of Alpha, but also those of Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, and so on, all the way up to Omega. And the same is going to apply to to beta and to gamma and to epsilon and so on, right? So alpha and beta can both make claims to sovereignty, but it's obtaining is contingent on the rest of the world. It's not just about alpha and beta, it's about everyone. Sovereignty on this account if not quite, is not quite the product of, but it is at least sustained by the recognition of sovereignty on the part of third parties representing the world community in abstracto. Bluntly, alpha controls T, territory T, if enough of the rest of the world says so. If enough of the rest of the world thinks that beta should back off. International law, in this kind of case, is nothing but the network of agreements between alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and so on. So this is parallel to the point made, in, made on page five, that states are likely to be internally plural. In itself, this makes no difference to sovereignty, though in practice, many of the others, many other states may see that as reasons to intervene, right? So we've got, it, again, it's, it's to do with what other people think about a, a state um, integrity. And this may wax or wane in line with prevailing attitudes elsewhere. Um, powers may make, claim, make claims to authority over T that come to be generally accepted after having not been, or equally the things, things may work in the other way. So for example, there was a period when nobody recognized by Afrin sovereignty, um, First of all, the British were there, and then the Nigerian government was there. And then there was a period where some people thought, well, maybe we could. And then they went, nah, maybe not, right? So the, 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 the balance of power shifts, it changes, sovereignty kind of waxes and wanes, but there will become a tipping point where enough people are going to say, okay, Biafra is worth taking seriously, but its sovereignty is on sufferance on this case. And if everyone just wakes up in the morning and goes, you know what, we've changed our minds, no more Biafra, and uh, then that's that's kind of the whole story. Um, so nor is there any obvious reason why de facto sovereignty may not in time become de jure, simply in as far as that sooner or later, a new state will be integrated into international systems somehow, right? So even if, imagine 
so Biafran breakaway state, and it manages to, to keep the Nigerian army out. Um, and it comes to some sort of informal agreement with other countries to do with shipping and who gets to, to, to keep the pirates away or something like that. Well, there you've got the nub of, inter of integration into, into, the, into the international community, and those agreements will become more sophisticated. And that's all you need for sovereignty, I want to say. There's, there's, no, there's nothing more to it than its integration into a web of agreements. And eventually the, Nigeri the Nigerians will kind of say, yeah, all right then, right? Because that's how history works. Um, sometimes the tipping point is reached fairly easily. So think of Slovenian secession from Yugoslavia, which was basically, yeah, all right. Uh, sometimes it's not. Chechnya would be a good example of that. Um, and sometimes it's ambiguous. So again, think of South Ossetia seceding from Georgia. That may be a bad faith one, it may be a good faith one, but it's certainly a failed one because no one else takes it seriously. Uh, and the same is going to apply the other way when it comes to states unifying. So Canada's sovereignty over Newfoundland has to do simply with everyone accepting, including the Newfoundland, Newfoundlanders, Newfoundland, the, the people live, living there. But, Canada has the right, I can't pronounce it. I tried, I failed. Um, but everyone just kind of agrees that Canada ha has the right to, to, to make laws. That's all you need. Okay. Sovereignty may sometimes be ambiguous. That's not a problem though with the concept, it's a problem for it. It may be suspended. Um, so there may be times when, for example, take Cambodia under UN tutelage. So here's a situation in which the international community, that's kind of ambiguous case because there was no claim there that Cambodia didn't exist. So it wasn't a kind of invasion in the, in the same sense that you know, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, they basically said, you know, Kuwait is now the 18th province of, of Iraq. There was nothing like that, but there was a sense in which there was a kind of paternalistic intervention. It says, well, the institutions are forming, um, Cambodia, the Cambodian government, there is no such thing as a sovereign Cambodian government. But again, since the book is about territorial integrity, and no one doubted that in the Cambodia case, I'll park that. But it does raise questions about whether sovereignty lies with states or with governments. Um, and again, we might have situations where it's genuinely ambiguous. So when the Norwegian royal family was evacuated to Canada in whenever it was 1940, um, does that mean that Norwegian sovereignty lapsed or does it sort of go on holiday? What's going on there? Slightly more complicated would be situations in which there are two candidate governments within a territory, perhaps after a period of unrest. So again, who has sovereignty in Libya? Again, no one really denies the boundaries of what, what is Libya as opposed to what is Egypt or, or Tunisia, or Algeria, whatever. But the question of who has the right to make laws on behalf of the people living in that territory um, is ambiguous. But again, because this book is about ter territoriality, I think we can park that. But let's bring it all back. So see if I can, in the last two minutes, see if I can bring it all back together to, to Jorge's book. He claims on page 159 that, so that a sovereignty, sovereignty dispute has to do with a conflict of interest. Now, if true, that seems to me to be a fairly small claim. One might justly wonder what counts as an interest of how we might understand accepted conflicts of interest. So the thought here is that two people who happen to desire the same thing may have interests in realizing that desire. Um, but that seems like a fairly trivial account of what it is to have a conflict of interest, right? It's, it's not the whole story. So it seems to me that even if we are seeking to adjudicate international disputes in as positivist a way as possible, we still do have to take an evaluative stance at some point. We can't just say alpha wants X and beta wants Y, because all we've done there is describe the contours. What we've got to be able to say is alpha's claim is strong for these reasons. <clears throat> we've got to be able to say which claims are worth listening to and which are not. And this does seem to me to dent the strong positivism of Jorge's preferred model because it relies on there being some kind of value claim implicit in any decision that we may make. Put another way, I think that one may one concern may be that Jorge is hyperbolically and implausibly good faith, but implausibly even handed. He seems to me to imply to assume that all boundary and territorial disputes are in good faith, and that strikes me as being false. Russia's claims about Ukraine are not right when when Lavrov said that Ukraine has never been a sovereign state. 
it's very easy to say, look at the original signatories of the UN Charter, right? The Ukrainian SSR was right there alongside Russia. What more evidence do you need that it has been a sovereign state, right? Similarly, was the referendum illegal or just not? I don't think we need to say it's illegal. We say, look, it's, it has no legal heft at all, just because no one takes it seriously, right? So who cares whether it's illegal? It just doesn't exist. Um, okay. Neither does it really do to say, I think, as Jorge does on page 160, that whether disputants are state actors or not, they have a common interest in exclusive sovereignty over territory. And this is because their interests may be analogous, they may be coincident, but they're not common. Because if they were genuinely common interests, there would not be a conflict. So what might we say about the Khmer example, this fictitious territorial dispute? So we've got three agents, we've got Khmer, this kind of disputed island. We've got Sylvadia and Borudia. They both have an interest in securing access to the resources on Khmer. But a reason to want control of territory is not the same, or acknowledging a reason to want control of territory is not the same as thinking that there is any plausible claim to sovereignty over it. That is any reason for other states to hold back from interference. So Jorge criticizes Borduria's approach to settling his dispute with Sylvadia on the grounds that, quote, their overall claim is not to settle the dispute but for their side to win. Well, OK, but isn't that what everyone wants anyway? My concern here is that. Trying to treat, trying to reconcile every, everyone's claims. Ends up with a kind of Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, right? Or at best a Munich agreement. So again, if you remember the, the Munich agreement, basically we took the, the, the Brits told Hitler, oh, have a bit of Czech, have a little bit of Czechoslovakia and we'll call it quits, right? But then if, but you've kind of given the game away there, right? Um, so when Ukrainian forces attempt to repel Russia from occupied territory, they do want their side to win. And I don't think that's an objection, right? I don't think we should be trying to find a common, common cause because that's to give, that's essentially to tell aggressors that, if, that they should overplay their hand so that they can negotiate back to where they wanted. And that is not a world I think that anyone wants to live in. Seeking compromises, seeking compromise compromises everyone. On the other hand, the question of whether Khmer is sovereign is in some senses a moral one. So again, this is a, a response to the positivism. In some sense, it's a moral claim. It's in other senses political. The moral question is one of whether Khmer should be recognized by the international community as having a status such that other states ought not to interfere with its policy making or encroach on its recognized borders. Politically or pragmatically, Khmer is sovereign if and only if no other state can control any part of Khmer's recognized territory or its policy making um, for fear of repudiation for elsewhere from the community. There might be all kinds of reasons for the positions taken by other states, and we would expect that. This sovereignty is a legal sovereignty to the extent that Khmer can enter into binding agreements with other states and reason expect them to be seen as part of the wider network of agreements. Do we need more than this? I don't know. I don't think we do. So I'm a little bit puzzled by the claim on between pages 166 and 170. But again, we heard a few minutes ago, the scholars take one aspect of this was the, the elephant, the, the blind men with the elephant. The scholars take one aspect of a given dispute and adhere to it as if it was the whole story. I simply don't think that that's true. At best, it seems to me to complete scholarship and a kind of activism. What any plausible scholar will do is to recognize that there is often a lot in play explaining how disputes arise. Now, of course, they will have a pers perspective and they will they will you know, riff on their perspective, but I don't think that necessarily means that they're um, you know, ignoring others. Um, and trying to take into account every possible approach I don't think it's going to solve disputes. I think it's going to guarantee that they are interminable. So what we're left with is a kind of cosmopolitanism. And in that sense, Jorge is completely right. But I wonder whether when his argument is at its strongest, he's actually pushing as an open door. Right, well, thank you very much. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. 
Thank you. So I've taken a different approach. I'm trying to I'll highlight some of the key elements of the methodology and have used the methodology outside territorial conflicts. So let's see how it goes. So it's OK. By focusing on the multidimensional paradigm that I quote acknowledges that limited sovereignty and the legal cosmopolitanism as compatible despite the tensions between the two concepts, it departs from that unidimensional approach that are fragmentary in analysis, analyzing global problems. And in so doing, to provide an explanation of why um, attempts to solve territorial disputes may and have fallen short, given that crises are framed either um, you know, in law or politics or international relations, as well as that positionality that Ian was referring to, that understood through the experiences of the scholar that inform methodological approaches, uh, whether consciously or not, and mainly focusing either in one agent or one context. Therefore, this multidimensional approach enables the analysis of territorial disputes or other global challenges, such as climate change, migration, pandemics and wars, which are some of the ones that Jorge mentions in the book, in their complexity. Bearing the system's nature of complex problems, where agents may play different roles and interact at different levels. So this multidisciplinary approach analyzes that what Jorge has called the phenomena of pluralism of pluralisms, where I will focus my attention. Pluralism of pluralism entails the recognition that an array of pluralisms that can be agents, players, context realms and modes of existence um, in the theory and methodology epitomizes that interplay. And I, I identified it when I was reading, I said, uh, the elasticity between that sovereignty um, and positive law cos cosmopolitanism, so sovereignty being understood as um, not absolute, so op opposed to absolute, and that positive law cosmopolitanism um, that accepts a coexistence of a diversity of legal systems, irrespective of their moral standing, not that there is, shouldn't be a judgment on them. Um, but being a, a positive approach, uh, Jorge has established that this at the moment not that it cannot be done, it's irrespective of this moral standing. So in the context, the book follows a pragmatic approach, acknowledging that states will not give away their sovereignty. However, this sovereignty should not be construed as absolute. Sovereignty can include the pluralisms because that limitedness is grounded in the political choice and the arrangements that inform those limitations, either the interest of a polarity of agents of the local, regional and international context, do not impinge on the existence of the state itself. Therefore, when sovereignty and cosmopolitanism are presented as a pluralism of pluralisms, both assume that migrant agents, be they states, communities or individuals, play different roles as hosts, participants, attendees or viewers, interrelating either the domestic, regional or international law context, which can be assessed either factually, normatively or axiologically, and that these pluralisms occur in linear ways or non-linear dimensions, thus creating patterns which are more foreseeable or others are orderly and others which are unexpected and which in turn are influenced by value um, variables such as time and space. So incorporating all these elements and interrelations into methodology to analyze a conflict or a global challenge while something recognizes that the complex problems cannot be analyzed partially and segmented approaches if an, if an adequate and long-standing solution is warranted. And I will briefly highlight some of the elements of the theory and their application to other areas which I'm not territorial dispute. So sorry about that. Okay. No, more so it's more paper. First, at the state level, such a methodology addresses the fallacy that the state's government represents with one voice all individuals and communities within its jurisdiction and its relationships in the domestic, regional and international context. Just as indubitably some states are more equal than others and thus have more power, despite the acknowledgement of the principle of sovereign equality of states in international law, at the domestic level, some agents, either individuals or communities, exert more power or influences than others in their governments. Thus, through this theory and methodology, the book brings visibility 
to agent either those individuals and communities that historically have been remained invisible to states. This invisibility, for example, of indigenous communities or descendants of runaway slaves uh, communities in Latin America uh, is a case in point, where these agents are usually left outside from decision making, meaningful consultations concerning their lands and generally from the framing of the problems where their interests are involved. So second, this theory and metal, methodology, uh, methodology entails a systems approach where each interrelation between agents and depending on the roles that they're playing in a particular context influences all the other elements of the system, even in those circumstances where an agent is viewing the problem or the conflict from far away. Jorge has explained this in the context of territorial disputes, which is the object of analysis in the book. However, the multidimensional approach and the notion of pluralism of pluralisms is applicable beyond territorial disputes, facilitating the analysis of an array of global challenges. Briefly, I will mention just one. So this is climate change and special measures or specifically in measures adopted to transition to low carbon economies. Developed countries want access to the critical minerals that are located in developing countries, which are necessary for the technologies uh, or technological developments in the renewable sector. These developing countries in turn have permanent sovereignty over the natural resources under international law. And in some cases are willing to enter into international agreements concessioning their exploitation. However, those critical minerals are usually located in indigenous communities. Um, in their lands and the environmental impacts of their exploitation includes uh, including the impact that this may have to climate change will not recognize state or regional boundaries. All of these uh, agents interact with each other in different contexts. Thus, it's clear from this brief example that the multidimensional approach and the notion of pluralism of pluralisms in the interplay between sovereignty and cosmopolitanism enables a more comprehensive, multifaceted and multicontextual assessment of global challenges. Third, by including variables such as space and time, the theory and methodology enables the contextualization of different claims and ultimately the analysis of the interplay between sovereignty and cosmopolitanism in a particular temporal and spatial dimension, enabling to reframe the problem according to the interplay of who are the agents, players and context or, and their modes in existence in this particular time and space. And finally, the book proposes a universal law that departs from the understanding of superior law, thus recognizing an array of legal systems that coexist and interact under a system of coordination, with the aim of balancing the different interests in law. This coordination is possible through legally binding and procedural principles, thus guaranteeing state sovereignty whilst offering a minimum standard in law, providing basic rights and access. So, in the current state of international law politics and international relations, a system of coordination will embrace the coexistence of contrasting legal and I will add economic systems without recurring to or exacerbating existing conflicts. We may agree or disagree with the values underpinning these contrasting legal and economic systems, for instance, neoliberalism or state capitalism. However, under the notion of pluralism of pluralisms, the interest embedded in these legal frameworks and economic frameworks should be understood without a framework, a framework of cooperation rather than the fight for subordination of one system over another. This will be the premise, I understand, of universal law that Jorge um, uh, promotes. However, there will, there will be eventually at some point an element of the judgment of you know, which one or the values of each of them or, or none of them. Um, this book offers some recommendations on the characteristics of a universal law, accessibility, humanity, effectiveness, simplicity and balancing and questions. The question remains, what would those principles be and how are those principles coming to existence? I would that good will participate in deciding them. Before I conclude, this book began explaining the relationship between sovereignty and cosmopolitanism articulated in the context of diverse crises and called for a paradigm shift. And I quote, to reframe crisis, to reassess situation and to discard the frames of past paradigms. 
In assessing international law as a crisis discussion, the Promont stresses that international law survival is based on crisis, its crisis and for crisis, and that this may represent a danger as international law may become wordless before catastrophic crises that do not fit within the scope of existing crisis narratives. The wordlessness of the international law will ultimately lead to the damage of the discipline as a whole. The multidisciplinary or multidimensional approach and the notion of pluralism of pluralisms offers a theory and a methodological approach to reassess and revisit those narratives and frames to provide wording to international law, which with due recognition of the interrelation of disciplines with issues of power, such as political sciences and international relations, and in accordance to specific temporal and spatial bar variables, offers a different alternative and broadens our scope of analysis to find these alternative approaches to rethinking about how those solutions would look and how can we address conflict and global challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much both to the speakers and to Jorge. Um, that was really valuable. Um, I, I wonder if we could just open up the, the floor and then maybe we respond both to Ian and Cecilia. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, very quickly as a response if you want, and then people can think uh, of questions. Because my response will be very brief. Quite a lot, you know, food yeah. for thought, and that's how we do academia, and that's what I tell my students as well, you know, how, because this is one of many steps. Uh, so coming back, thank you very much, both of you, for the detail, uh, because I can see the care you put. And in particular, yes, I, I I see quite a few points that I will need to sharpen. So thank you very much. <laughs> that's a hat off to you. Um, but in particular, you know that it may be a type of something because I'm concerned about the slavery example you mentioned at first. So I'm going to, to double check that one because I had the same issue when I was proofreading. Yeah. Um, so I'll check if the, 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 that was a mistake. Okay. But, um, in particular, what I wanted to say, um, and again, I put quite a few things here. Um, but yeah, the, the, the notions I use are intentional. Like, I mean, you mentioned a few. You, you mentioned the Cambodian example, the Libyan example, and so on, a conflict of interest. Here, I use intentionally a broad uh, notion, such as the one from Rawls, a conflict of interest, simply because we have so many different territorial disputes that I was uh, trying to unify the sort of uh, approach I was taking. But then it would be a case of, exp that's why one of my next steps would be territorial disputes in the Americas, and that would be even be enough. Mm -hmm. Then I would have to go to the Falklands in particular, uh, the border between Mexico and in particular, and so on. So that has to do with intentional vocabulary, you know, to use. Uh, so yeah, I can only agree with, with the comment. Now, I, I'm, going, I'm not going to defend this one. I get your point, but I'm going to use it as an example. The referendum in Crimea does not exist. Uh, and I'm going to uh, to be here, Ken Reeves, the devil's advocate. Uh, I'm not defending Putin, by the way, or anything else. But what I'm trying to say, I had the same comments um, when I was uh, tweeting, and Hafred was helping me today, uh, you know, retweeting some things. And I has a British scholar, um, and I don't know if he follows me or whatever, but he makes the same comments. And I'm pro um, people, pro Falkland Islanders, pro Crimean, and pro uh, ta ta ta. But the same comment he makes about um, Argentina and the situation in, uh, there is no territorial dispute in the, the Falcon. Well, wait a second, there is still a legal uh, dispute. Uh, so whether we uh, simply say the referendum in Crimea, or if I'm Argentinian, the referendum in the Falkland does not exist, we are not acknowledging that the other party is actually telling us there is something going on. I'm not telling you it was legal, I'm not telling you there was a referendum. We need mm -hmm. to acknowledge there was a referendum and we need to have a serious discussion about why it is illegal. Not simply tell uh, others or the media or the public in general, the referendum was a nonsense or it didn't happen because it was put inside the Do you see where I'm coming from? Because I've heard the same in other cases, such as Argentina's claiming that Falkland Islanders don't exist legally because they don't have any right to self-determination yep. uh, so uh, again these kind of expressions um, it's been uh, most of my life since i was a child uh, but on the other uh, on the other side you know of the atlantic the referendum in Crimea does not exist well the referendum in the Falkland does mm -hmm. not exist so i've heard the same sentence over and over again depending on who is talking so again we have to be mindful and that's why the pluralism uh, again i'm not 
please don't read here, I'm supporting a particular referendum uh, because there are human rights involved and so on. Uh, but again, we have to be careful about that. Uh, and yeah, the, the one thing I have to, I mean, to me, that's the further publication where you're talking about the alpha, the B, and then the rest. Yeah, that's when I'm talking about game theory and you already were feeding me to, you know, to be thinking about other other things how to, but that would be highly theoretical. So yeah. that's one of the reasons you are here, not simply because you're Ian Brassington, because I, I wanted a philosopher like Ian Brassington to show people, you know, how peculiar legal philosophers are. Mm -hmm. uh, no, because we need that level of um, detail Perfect. if we want to do public international law proficiently. And this is not uh, simply not to be nice uh, to you. I think yeah. it's because public international lawyers are not that particular. They talk about these concepts so freely uh, and uh, we, they tend to be very condescending about legal philosophers. And to me, it's high time we work together in order to be more particular. And I'm more than happy to go back to my book and sharpen, thanks to Ian's comments, because we need to keep on evolving. And I think uh, that's what we need to do at public law international level. And I uh, Andrew left. And that's why we need uh, units such as jurisprudence, because we need to have this discussion. It's a pity. I mean, you are my colleagues, some of here, we need to bring jurisprudence. And it should be, if not mandatory, at least an option. And I, I think you're completely right about that. So, um, I mean, yeah, the, it, it, you're right to suggest, if your analysis is correct, that one of the problems is that you've got lots of people talking past each other. And there's a lot of these putative problems actually turn out to be people just using language in different ways. That's and, all. And that's yeah. precisely, you know, this, this, this is the kind of, I, I used to be very, very dismissive of kind of like 1950s, slightly tweedy Oxbridge analytic philosophy, but it's really good at untangling these linguistic disputes and dissolving some problems, but spotting where the real problems are. Exactly, and where it's not, not simply the surface. Talking uh, about different things and therefore, yeah, never, is that Scottish joke about oh, Scottish washerwomen in, in Edinburgh? Uh, who's a, used to scream abuse at each other from their windows and that their, their their beef was never settled because when push came to shove they were arguing from different premises but don't tish but it's just, it's that kind of thing um that yeah it's some sort of pairing what's going on in a debate linguistically to see if people really are talking about the same thing um is, but from is, which standpoint is, yeah because we may be talking about this but yeah. from the different standpoint precisely yeah yeah. yeah 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 so thank you very much again other comments but i, I wanted to be you know precise here and yeah. cecilia in particular because i i said that in, in in every you know first or second page in all my books this is only an application this is only a theory limited to a book or to a presentation but thank you so much because you are talking about applying and it goes beyond you know mine because i decided to go to for territorial disputes in, in fact yeah you are completely right. Thank you for that, uh, because this is a theory slash methodology that could be applied potentially to other things to comprehend. Because I think it's high time for humans right now. And yeah, I'm Star Trek in that sense because I see uh, unless we change mindset, uh, I, I see simply darkness in our future. And what I didn't say, I had students from Kashmir uh, last academic year. I see. If we don't have, if you don't change mindset, humans don't change mindset. The 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 see the things we see in the Middle East, we will see soon in places like Kashmir or in Antarctica. Again, I'm almost 50, so I don't think I'm going to see that. But I can see uh, your child, for instance, in 50, 60 years time, you know, having the same issues unless we change mindset uh, and it, that kind of approach, you know. Uh, I can only do a bit. Uh, same questions I have in Colombia or in Peru, and people were asking me, ah, how can we apply this to Bogota and the FARC? You know, the guerrillas, the, um, the civil movement we have in Latin America. But it's your work, it's not mine. So I'm offering you your methodology, but I'm only one person. So if you want to do that, and thanks to Cecilia as well, uh, because that's valuable. That's what I mean by more paper. <laughs> um, because more paper means you ask people to reframe the way they think. And I think uh, that's the mission of, about this, uh, my books in general, to create a platform for discussion because we need to reframe the way we think. So thank you very much, Cecilia, as well. Uh, that's it, Hasred. Perfect. I'm just conscious of time as well. Um, so perhaps we take three or four questions and take two at a time. Yeah. Ask, ask, and, and I'm not as I'm not as great a public international in any way at all. I'm not, but I'm sure you are. Ask the Vienna Convention. 
Okay, surely that is your, surely that recognizes the existence of universal law. Yeah, that actually we have it already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not to use cognitive. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. But for me, is that a result of pooling of sovereignty at that level, or is it something that's somehow imposed? Basically? Well, historically, it has to do with it. You know, pooling, uh, but the idea behind it, it has to do with these powers, you know, that were uh, in terms of vertical thinking, we're thinking of verticality. So although you, they were using, you know, the expression and they were thinking about universal law, uh, to me, and that's Jorge Nunez here, very subjective, to me, it's simply a means to perpetuate that verticality. Right now, if, unless again, we think of other views rather than simply vertical in the sense of only certain states acknowledging only these principles, we will still carry on doing the same we have right now, which means uh, at the General Assembly level, only some state may have an opinion that's worthy of being um, a resolution. Or if we have the Security Council, only some state being able to actually exercise power um, so in that sense, I still see verticality. I acknowledge, yeah, you are right, uh, Vienna Convention, I acknowledge the room is there. Uh, you finish here, Ian, with one of the, your last expressions, the door open. Yeah, the door is open here as well. So my book is an open door. The door is open here as well, the, the Vienna Convention. It's just how we use that door, whether to still think of verticality or to reframe how we use the Vienna Convention in order to, for instance, I'll put an example. Uh, there is room uh, and there is debate right now um, to incorporate other members at the UN Security Council level. Uh, we are thinking Brazil, we are thinking, uh, again, non-central countries in principle. Is that enough? For me, it is not enough. It is a step. It is a step. It's not enough. Um, would that fit in the Vienna Convention? To me, it doesn't, because I still see verticality. Brazil, and I'm pro-Brazil, by the way, I'm pro-Mexico, uh, but Brazil is one of the strongest countries in Latin America. Why not Bolivia? Why not other uh, countries? And again, I'm talking about Latin America because I don't want to hurt other people's feelings. So again, it depends how we apply. Uh, it, the article enough? No article is enough. We are lawyers. So articles are simply an open door. It's the way we use those articles. Uh, and right now, what we have and the amendments I see, even including, you know, at Security Council level, country like Brazil, I don't think that's enough. But probably because I see, uh, and again, I'm paraphrasing here, here, I see something like Star Trek for the future, if we want to change mindset, really. Uh, I'm thinking about that kind of uh, universal law. Acknowledging that we don't talk about states only, we should embrace somehow communities and individuals. And what I mean by communities, natives have little to do with defined states as we know them nowadays. Or oh, we were talking earlier about cases of Pakistan or regimes that are not democratic. And usually societies within the, these regimes or communities within these regimes are not really supporting those legal regimes. In fact, they are usually against those legal regimes, but they don't really have any voice uh, at the international level. So coming back to you, uh, yeah, we do have the article, we do have the convention, uh, we do have some institutions, we have amendments or proposals for amendments, uh, better, better said. But, I know it is a, certainly, no, uh, and again, the UN Charter uh, or the Vienna Convention, beautifully crafted, beautifully crafted, uh, but that, that, that's the normative side. When I'm talking normative, axiological and factual, but the axiological, you know, how we value, how we judge them, when I mean judge them, and the we, who are we? The state, because in fact, not all states are equals. In fact, not all communities are equals. In fact, not all individuals are equal. So we need to acknowledge that if we actually want to embrace that article fully. Did, did you see what I'm saying? Thank you very much, Daniel. I come from a very simplistic my background is economics and looking to, to what you're saying you talk about the state and i think we've got lots of organizations which are bigger than states you look at so tesla you look at some of these international companies and they will move around they will do things they have got larger sort of 
financial power from virtually any other any state. And even if you look back in England, in history, you've got the East India Company, you've got the Hudson Bay Company, which even had armies, and you could go through. And so I think just to look at the state, we need to be a little bit more encompassing of understanding all these other factors which are coming in and which are very, very strong. Excellent point. Yeah, I have to say, can I add? Excellent point. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, I uh, use the vocabulary very broadly states, communities, and uh, individuals. That to me would have to do tightly with communities because I've seen the same. I, I use the example in Brazil, but we can think of examples in places in which we have natural resources. You will have multinationals or companies such as Tesla with more power than the actual states. Yeah. They influence, I'm talking about power. You know, they may actually interfere in um, my. Um, Coming up book probably next year, uh, one of the chapters has to do with European traditional intervention in the America, such as the UK. But then I go for chapter, I think six, we were talking with Cecilia about this. Uh, I'm exploring how Russia, China, India, and the United States are interfering in Latin America. For good and for bad, I'm, I'm simply. And that has to do not only governmental intervention or interference, but through private companies as well. Uh, and you have to push out a brief example. China and India follow a similar approach in the same in the sense they're interfering in America. In fact, they are related to some territorial disputes. Yeah, uh, apart from natural resources exploitation and exploration. But the 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 reason behind, although they will claim a reason behind such as goodwill and you know helping and solidarity, that's probably more clearly expressed in publications and research coming from India. In publications, again, I haven't had access to people in India, uh, but then in China it's very clear it's governmentally led. So there is a clear intention for something else rather than people being the main interest. It has to do with natural resources and territorial access to those natural resources. So the, 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 the way Chinese and Indian, for whatever reason, would will or simply exploitation and exploration of natural resources, the link is natives in order to have access to the claims in Mexico, Brazil, and so Ecuador, and so on. Uh, so yes, certainly. And that had to do, coming back to Cecilia here, further exploration because again it will be applying this methodology but now how would multinationals all these international companies are able to manipulate uh, between i'm not being uh, negative in the word in here it's simply manipulation for good or for bad uh, how are they are able to manipulate uh, state and communities for their own means regardless of the country of origin because they may have little to do with america or the uk they have their own interests at play. So yeah, very fair question and very interesting question. Yeah, thank you very much. And this, I mean, I, East India Company is an obvious example of that, and we could imagine a situation, I guess, in which they manage things a little bit better, and the British haven't had to pull the plug. Yeah. And so we could imagine the East India Company claiming sovereignty over, let's say, Completely. the Bay of Bengal or whatever. Um, but there is also, like, the what are they called? Um, I say seascapers, but that's not right. The, the kind of libertarian nutcases, uh, the, the Peter Thiels of this world. Yeah. Um, so there is a proposal that I saw not so long ago about someone who wants to essentially set up what amounts to an oil rig somewhere in the middle of the outside yeah. of ter extraterritorial waters. Uh, and, the, and the offer is that this will be a place where you can go and do business and do sort of high tech mega squillionaire stuff without the interference of the state and sort of trade bit. So again, we could imagine there's something kind of analogous to, <clears throat> to, to a state going on there. Um, I guess the weakness of that is that unless they're desperate to export fish, you know, they are going to rely on real states for, for security and for, for food and stuff like that. But yeah, so there's, there's lots of ways in which the state model potentially you fray at the edges. Yeah. Thanks. Um someone online have a question? Do we have a question from online? Hello? Yeah, you have a question? Okay. Yes, uh, follow up to Dr. Damien's question, the fact that we already have, a, you know, a, a set of universal law because we have UN Charter and you know, Vienna Agreements and stuff like that. So how would a universal law be different than that? Because you mentioned that we, we need to achieve that horizontal, you know, horizontality. The fact that hypothetically, 
let's say that each every country has you know accepted that other country is sovereign and they they're all equal in in our ideal state but then that further divide countries and you did mention that there, there are conflict of interest between countries and stuff like that they, they all have their own interests but then that further divide the, the world itself in, in, a, in a very you know uh, due to their conflict of interest that would uh, create a different set of world politics and you know we'll will eventually come back to where we are right now Okay, I see your point. Uh, yes, um, it's not the same as the UN uh, Charter, because right now UN Charter has limitations in the sense it's interrelated, if there is an interrelation with regionalism and domestic law. So what I'm proposing is universal law in order to coordinate all these three. Domestic jurisdictions, regional jurisdictions, such as um, the law of American states, organization or uh, ASEAN in Asia or uh, African Union and so on, and United Nations, or the law of the sea or any other international uh, legal norm. Mm -hmm. uh, now, would it create more conflict? Uh, yes, in principle, yes, that's why I'm proposing soft, um, and I'm not including, I'm going for the exclusive positivism because I'm not including uh, issues such as justice. Because whatever may be just for me, may not be just for you. Whatever may be just for India, may not be just for Pakistan. Whatever is just for the UK, may not be just for. That's why intentionally, if not I am against uh, values and uh, judgments. No, uh, but I don't think uh, humankind is ready to make that move yet. Uh, so in order to avoid these conflicts you're talking about, that's why I propose a particular way of coordination, uh, which is not my vocabulary, it's legal theory, which I call exclusive uh, positivism in sense of cosmopolitan arrangement. Uh, so a set of soft uh, legal principles that may enable different legal systems, domestic, regional and global, such as the United Nations, whether they are democratic or not democratic, whether they are fair or unfair. Uh, why I'm saying this, I may not agree with some legal regimes, personally, Jorge Núñez, but if I want to make it work, and again, the key word was pragmatism, uh, Cecilia mentioned that, yeah, I, 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 I had to be pragmatic in the choice, that's what I went for, that choice, because I don't think we are ready as a global society to make the move and have this discussion right now. Before having that discussion, we need to coordinate ourselves, and only then, when we are coordinating all these systems, we may be able to finally have a discussion what is fair, what is unfair. Is it fair to um, use religious texts to decide the face of LGBTQ people? But that's a, a further discussion down the historical line. I don't think we are ready yet. Yeah. But we certainly need to coordinate these systems that right now they don't seem to be working together. I'm not telling you they are not efficient, but they may be efficient individually, but that's why they tend to fail when we need to deal with the same situation because we need coordination. Yeah. And that's why coming back to you, and that's why the example of COVID is not really related to um, territorial dispute per se, but I just wanted to make a clear point that was, there was lack of global coordination, uh, you know, to have uh, mainly access to. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I answer the, the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, um, if I... Yeah, just Damien, time wise, to the timekeeper, I think we're kind of that correct speaking the end. Um, it says 5.30. Ah, we have the full. Yeah, we, three minutes over. We have the food. Before we go, if I may, is that okay? Two more minutes, because I'm not going to take these books and I wanted to do this in person representing. I'll find them later. But this one, because I have a few copies, this one I have to read to my British academic brother. <laughs> this one representing oh, British done. people, it has to be for you. And all my students, I only have six. Uh, one went to my parents, uh, one went to Shusha, it's it Shusha Menegal in Brazil. One is mine, and this one is representing all my students. Don't get jealous, but it has to be you. Thank you. I'll find them later, but thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thank you. Say there's wine next door. Wine and a bit yeah. of food as well. Yeah, next door, the Thank after party. Fine. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank that was good. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Parker. Thank you, Cecilia. Gracias. De nada. And, uh, and I want this. Eh? I want this. Yeah, but, but I want this as well. I can send you online. Oh, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Go.
With that, I have already my fifth one. My fourth one, no, because it's America, but with this, I have my fifth one. <laughs> I mean that. As long as I get a footnote. <laughs> No, we can do a collaboration. That's what I'm doing with the next one in collaboration. Oh, what are you doing with more writing? I love writing. Oh, yeah. And I love writing with someone. They still exist. Honestly, honestly, but I'm very pushy. So, you know, you will have that work with me. Okay, you don't, you don't have me too. When you have but, yeah, I don't have you. I don't have it, don't have it, don't have it live. <laughs> no, 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 do I, but I'm just as so staggering. I do have a live either, but uh, I, I do have kids, and I keep changing everything. And when you have kids, yeah. you come prepared with everything, because I threw the copy here. So I don't say the line. We are going to the line. So the sovereignty of country. Gracias, gente online. Thank you very much. The money that comes is taking this step of the way. Yeah, so you're telling me that.